Hey guys, it's me. Uh, just wanted to check back in and do a little webisode. I don't know how long this is going to be. Um, I had some requests to talk about my time in treatment, and I think that's probably what I should do. I mean, this started out back in the day as the A&R project, which we all know how that wound up. Then it became the A project, and it was supposed to be me focusing on me and my, my growth and, and my um, development. But it was very soon after that that I added a, a, another co-host, basically. And I think I kind of got away from what I was trying to accomplish. So maybe if I talk about my treatment experience this time, it'll help because that's really the reason why I do this blog. So basically the first week that I was in treatment this time at Parkwood, same place as I went last time in my States over a year, um, the same place. And this time when I went there, I knew what to expect. And I've been to treatment four times in the past three years, twice at Lakeside, twice at Parkwood. And you know, in a treatment environment, you kind of come to expect certain things. Um, not least of which is people shining lights in the rooms when you're asleep. And a lot of complaints about that. Um, that is an insurance issue with the hospital. They have to shine a light and watch you take three breaths before they can leave the room. They have to make sure that you're still alive. Something else I found out, all the charts that they walk around and are writing on the whole time. I mean, for those of you who've never been to treatment, you wouldn't know. But for those who have, they're writing down on their on their notepad and everything like that. Um, they are writing down the very position that you're sleeping in. Like if you're sleeping on your right side on your stomach, that's what they write down. If they come back 15, they got to do this every 15 minutes. If they come back and you've switched over to your left side on your stomach, they're going to write that down too. So they're constantly keeping an eye on you. Um, and that's just par for the course, no matter where you go. So you get these people that complain. They were shining light right in my eyes. And I'm like, just you know, go back to sleep and forget about it, okay? I I would fall asleep, and once I was asleep, I was asleep. I didn't see anybody at the door knocking or anything like that. You know, I just dealt with it. And it's been that way all four times that I've been to treatment. But we had, the first week that I was there, we had a couple of people who, uh, I will call them GNR, <laughs> who uh, were very were a very negative influence on the whole group. Now, I remind you, you're in a treatment facility. You are locked in this place, and you are with strangers for 12 hours out of the day and three meals of, of the day. So there's a lot of different personalities and different perspectives and stuff like that, and... Um, the two G and R, um, they were a negative influence on the group. They were, I mean, I don't want to say hood rat, but that's kind of in the parlance. That's how you would describe them. Um, and I don't say that as a judgment against them. I mean, aside from the fact that they showed their character to everyone in the building and it had a negative effect on everybody's mood. Uh, once they left, the mood on the unit just totally lifted and people were all getting together and talking with different ones that they hadn't talked to before. People you wouldn't see together before these two people were there were interacting and talking and sharing their stories outside of group because we had process groups, like two process groups a day, one for mood, one for chemical dependency. And uh, I went to the one of chemical dependency and uh, 
you know, heard some people's stories and stuff like that. Um, basically, uh, one day, one of the techs, Miss Y, we shall call her, um, she was running a group. It wasn't a process group. It was just kind of one of those, I guess you'd call it a bullshit group that the techs would run during the middle of the day. And it was the middle of the day, you know, people were getting hungry and, and this, that, and the other. But two of the guys that were in there, we'll name them M and W, um, were very vocal beforehand about Miss Y because they both felt that she disrespected them when they came in. And they started holding that grudge. And they would make fun of Mrs. Y, calling her alien versus predator because she had a wig and the way she looked and talking about how she, uh, she probably drinks all day. She probably went and got a fifth on her lunch break and stuff like that. And so really disrespectful. So we were having the group, she was running the group and it was a sheet of the 10 rules to live by or something like that. And one of them was based loosely on Emerson's quote, there is no reality, only perception. And the advice underneath it, the strategy underneath it was re-examine the filters through which you see life. And so I chimed in after these guys talked about how they got disrespected. I chimed in and said, you know, um, I've been to treatment four times, twice at Lakeside, twice at Parkwood. I've never once had, had a problem with a tech with a nurse, with a psychiatrist, with a therapist, none of them. I respect them, they respect me. I mean, maybe you should, and then I said, stop myself, and I said, maybe people should re-examine what it is they consider disrespect. Well, the two of them didn't like that very much, and they stood up, they had their words to tell the group, M did, he kind of took the, took the lead, and he told the group, and he didn't have to sit there and listen to this shit. And then both of them left the group and were outside running their mouths. But later on that night, um, the nurse, the med nurse, or the nurse on the unit, came up to me to take my vitals, because they do that quite often. Um, and she said, I heard you really stood your ground today in that group, in, in the face of you know ridicule. And I really want you to know how much I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. I was like, well, thank you. I, I didn't even realize that I'd done anything. Thing is, I did go to M and W. Um, I went to them separately. And I said, look, I apologize if what I said in group offended you. That wasn't my intention. And maybe I should learn when to shut the fuck up. And the one dude, M... He was always a very well-spoken, just well-spoken, well-vocabulary kind of guy. But the second I said that to him, he started stuttering. He was like, no, you, you, you right. It was like my apology to him was so unexpected that it threw him into a stuttering fit. And it was almost like he was having to drag the words, you're right, out of his mouth to say to me. It was really something. So anyway, after that little experience, I started talking to him uh, at great length sometimes when we were out on smoke breaks. and everything. Yeah, you could smoke there, by the way. So, um, which is good because I smoke a lot. But anyway, um... I started talking to him, and it turns out he's a 32nd degree Freemason, which was interesting. And I said, is it true that, I knew it was true, but I said, is it true that Washington, D.C. is laid out in a pentacle? And he said, yeah, the monuments are. I was like, oh, okay. And I, I kind of barely mentioned that I had read the book The Lost Symbol by Dan Brown, which has a lot of information about the Freemasons. And I was like, um, isn't it true that you guys kind of revere 
the the people that laid the cornerstone of the temple. And he said, yeah, King Solomon, the temple. And, and I was like, Ecclesiastes is my favorite book of the Bible. And he's like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, 1 through 11 is one of my favorites to everything. There's a time and a place, in a season under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, you know. And he's like, oh, okay. I was like, but, but not King Solomon. It's the people, the actual people that laid the cornerstone for the temple that you revered. J J J J Jeboam, J Jeboam Jebus or something like that. And he's like, well, that I'm not at liberty to say. And that set a chill up my spine. I was like, whoa, really? And so that was kind of cool. And he actually said to me, Aaron, you're a pretty smart man. And I was like, I... I took that as a compliment. That was that was pretty fucking cool. Um, I met some other people um, that were really nice. There was a lady whose name was H, and she was probably early to mid fifties. Very good shape for a woman her age. I mean, if that's not sexist to say, but um, she uh. When she first came in, they didn't have a bed on the east unit, which is where the non-crazies go. And so they had her on the north unit, which is the geriatric unit, which is essentially like a nursing home. Alzheimer's, dementia patients, it's horrible in there. I've never heard a good story about that unit. And she was in the group telling us about it, how she had to spend the night on the north unit with people just screaming in the middle of the night, people accusing her of taking things, walking in her room. And she was just like, this, this is, I will never come back here. She was in tears. And I'm like, you know, that kind of sucks. I mean, just because of her age, but also because they didn't have a bed, they could have put her on West, which would have traumatized her too. But you're coming to treatment to get better and you get traumatized while you're there. Yeah. I have to say that this time in Parkwood, it wasn't, it wasn't as well run this time as it was the last time I was there. Um, it just wasn't. And that was stressful because you had people, like I said, GNR and M and W who were constantly bitching and complaining about their the techs who disrespected them and stuff like that calling her names you know just calling her bitch to her face and stuff like that not just like that doesn't sit well with me and so i would just remove myself but that one day that the two guys walked out of the group and then g and r were out there in the in the hallway and they were all talking that that triggered my inner, you know, I like attention, but I don't like negative attention, especially if it's behind my back. But, and I know I shouldn't give a shit about that, but I was, my anxiety and my anger level were way up. And they had had me on Ativan to detox from the alcohol and the day before was my last dose. So I had had the Ativan to keep me calm and then all of a sudden it stops. And I'm, and in this stressful situation, I was telling the nurses all day that my anxiety and my anger were skyrocketed and they didn't pay attention to me. And so I walked back to my room and I got in my room and I laid down on the bed and I just stared at the ceiling and just started going, Aah! Aah! over and over, like three or four times. And then tears came to my eyes. And I was like sitting there like this with my hand over my eyes. And the nurse came to the door and was like, are you okay? And I, was, and I explained the situation to her. I said, uh, I told her about the group and how it triggered me 
and that I was in a delicate state, eyes on the crisis, okay? And so she left and nothing happened. And then I got up that night, I got up a little later and I walked in there, I was still fuming. And the night nurse, who was the one that told me that she appreciated what I did, she was like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I told her, I explained the situation to her exactly as I did to the nurse who came in my room. And I was like, I, I gotta have something. And so she called the doctor, which the nurses before could have done themselves, but anyway. She took mercy on me and she called the doctor and he ordered me another Ativan. So she goes, I want you to take this and your night meds and just go somewhere and stay away from these people because they're, they're, they're toxic for you right now. And so I did, I took my night meds and I went in my room and I read my book. And that was the end of that. But, um, so there were challenges in treatment, you know, and Sometimes I was told, no, you can't have that. You're just going to have to use your coping skills. Well, I thought that going into my room and, and hollering at the ceiling instead of throwing things and making a mess was a pretty good way of coping. Um, that was, that was uh, advice that somebody had given me one time. Just scream at the invisible person in the room and relieve your stress. And that's what I did. But. Thank God we didn't have a sugar hog. Uh, usually times in treatment, someone else sit there with a the sugar container and just turned up and sit there and pour, 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 pour. And still their coffee is like sludge. But we didn't have that this time. Um. The person that was running the CD group this time, the chemical dependency group this time, was actually a student who was training the last time I was at Parkwood, two years ago, two and a half years ago. So I knew her. And, uh, you know, it was nice to see a familiar face. And it made me more comfortable to share in the groups that I was in. And sharing in the groups allowed the people around me in the group, you know, when I'm sharing my hard luck story or my shit story or the, or the bad shit that I've done in, say, in search of my addiction, it gives other people permission in the group to tell their stories. And the telling is getting it out, getting it out there. It's like a, I call it a garden weasel. You remember the garden weasel that had tines and it had a big stick and you stuck it down on the ground and you twisted and you pulled up and it's like you're getting to that dirt underneath and you're tilling it up to the surface and letting it breathe. And that was my advice to everybody, you know, and either, either express advice to them or by my example was my advice to them. Open up in group, talk about your shit, get it out in the open and see if it doesn't make you feel better. And that, the whole time that they're doing that, they're sharing their stories, it's helping me because it's helping me put my shit in perspective, which I've tried to do with this blog, with my writing earlier on and now with these webisodes, I'm trying to raise awareness about these things so they don't seem so, um, I'm trying to think of the word. It don't seem so foreign. And if you ever happen to have to go to treatment, some things that you can expect. So that's, that's essentially why I'm doing this webisode. And if I think of anything else to talk about, about treatment, then I'll add it to this or, or do another one. But I think I've got enough material for now. So, thanks a lot for watching. Um, like, comment, subscribe. You can do that on the blog or you can do it on YouTube. Either way. Um, I hope to see you soon.